We're now going to look at some advanced analysis types. I'll start with moving load analysis. So within a moving load analysis, we'll be able to generate an array of load cases with each load case representing a snapshot of the axle wheel loads that we've defined at different locations. And we can define custom wheel patterns or use some pre-existing databases to define our model and our loads. So we're going to look at an example of using a single lane moving load analysis right now. And we're going to build the model from scratch in SRAM. So I have a blank model here. And I'm going to start by turning on a one meter spacing grid just to help me lay out uh, the geometry. I'm going to create two members using the member definition tool. And each one of these will be 20 meters long. And I'm going to use uh, the number of links equal to eight. So I'm going to have nodes along the length of the member. And you'll see why in just a minute. So I'm going to have one member start along the zero point of the x-axis of the global coordinate system, or y-axis, rather. I'm going to do another one that is six meters away from that. So just counting the grid lines, that's two meters, three, four, five, six. I could have just copied and pasted the other one, but that's the method I chose. And I want to make sure here that they have steel material properties, which is what I see now. We'll also notice that we're not using physical member modeling. So each one of these members, despite the fact that it's made up of several different links, is going to be comprised of a unique member ID. So I have members 1 through 8 and members 9 through 16. And so these are going to form the two lanes for which my members are going to travel, or my wheel loads are going to travel over. But I'm also going to define a shell element mesh to represent the actual deck of my bridge. And to do that, I'm going to use the panel element tool. I'm going to use the shell mix mesh panel. I'm going to assign a thickness of 100 millimeters. I'm going to use a concrete material, 35 MPa concrete. A mesh density, I'm going to set equal to 30. I keep the seed density as is, and the quad weight here, I'm going to enter a quad weight of 99%. And this just basically dictates the approximate percentage of elements generated in the meshing algorithm that are quadrilateral versus triangular when we're using a mixed mesh. Again, more details are available within the F201 online training course. Now I'm just going to draw around my model here to make my panel. So I'm just going to draw around the edges. I'm going to generate the mesh. As you can see here, we've got our mesh generated. The reason I generated those joints within the mesh using those eight links was that it's going to give me the opportunity to have the mesh grab onto something during the meshing algorithm so that I can ensure connectivity between the members and the mesh at various locations. I also want to define some steel sections for these members since they don't have any sections defined yet. So I'll right click on the section property tool. I'll click on the steel button. And I'm just going to look for a member that will work for me. I'll actually just go with the largest section for now, the WWF 2000 by 732. I'll press Add to and then OK. And it's been added to my local database. And see the properties. It's a large section. And I'll press Close. So now I'm modeling basically a connection between the mesh and the members using this WWF 2000 by 732. They're all modeled to connect at their center line by default. Uh, if we wanted to do a different type of connectivity, we could use dummy members like we've seen in previous examples. I want to consider my support conditions as well. And I've got a lot of nodes along each length, but I'm going to say that this is more or less a simply supported span. So I'll click on the support tool, looking from the top down and make sure this one end here is fully fixed. And on the right hand side here, I'm going to just define a slightly different uh, constraint. So it's going to be more of a roller style support. So TY and TZ will still be constrained. Sorry, I'm 
pressing the wrong one there. So ty and tz will be constrained as well as rx. And I'm just going to left click and apply that to these joints right here. So I'm allowing it to basically elongate on this side or contract, but it won't be able to move side to side. Now let's go ahead and go to the loads window and we're going to create a new load case. I'm going to click new load case and I'll give the name moving load. Just a useful name for me to recall what the load case contains. And I'm going to right click on this moving load tool. It looks just like a truck with a little blue back to it. I'll right click on this to open the next dialog. And see here, this is where we'd specify our moving load pattern, which members it's assigned to, the increments, and so on. But we also need to specify our wheel loads. And to do that, I can click on this chart button. Now this chart button is currently empty. I don't have any wheel load patterns loaded up yet, but we do have some available within SRAM. If you click on the open button, you'll be brought to the database location, which you can see here where different wheel load patterns are defined for you. And I'm going to select this one, move data.dml. I've made a couple of other versions of this, but you may not have all of them on your end. That's OK. Just look for the move data.dml file. This is a database of wheel load patterns that can be referenced by multiple models. You can also, if you define your own, you can send it to your colleagues, and they can load it up in their models as well. So within this moving load database wheel load pattern, we've got several different types of moving loads, uh, or sorry, wheel load patterns. So we, you can see here basically how it's represented. This distance here is more of an incremental distance. You can see we start at a uh, distance of zero, then we go one increment of 4.262 meters away with another wheel load, and follow that up with another wheel load that's another 4.626 meters away from the previous one. And there's all sorts of different ones available uh, that may or may not meet your requirements. If they don't, you can always specify your own within the spreadsheet. I'm just going to grab one here. I'm going to go with the H20 by uh, 44, or it's HS20 by 44. And I'm going to press the OK button. Now you can see that this pattern will now appear within the moving load tool dialog. But I need to tell it which lanes it's going to be applied to. So I'm going to say from member one to member eight, which is along this lower edge here, I'm going to have a lane that's defined with this wheel load pattern moving forward, and it's going to be within the orientation of global negative Z. We're all familiar, sorry, global negative Z. Let me make sure it's going the right way. We're all familiar with our global coordinate system by now. So the positive z-axis is pointing up. And if I want these wheel loads to be going down, I'm going to say global negative z. I'm also going to give it an increment. I'm going to say 0.2 meters. And what this means is that when I run a linear static moving load analysis, these wheel loads are going to be marched at various increments across my members, my lanes in this case. And each snapshot of those wheel load patterns will be a different load case and the increment for which how between each wheel load pattern movement is defined here 0.2 meters so i'll press add and now you can see i have lane one defined and i'll press ok and that's really all we need to do to get this thing started at this stage i can go ahead and run a linear static moving load analysis so i can click analyze I can choose the type of analysis I want, and it's a linear static moving load analysis. I also have the option to combine my generated vehicle loads, which you'll see in just a minute, with other load cases or combinations here. So this is done a little differently than other types of load cases and combinations. I'm not going to worry about that, though, because I just have the one load case. So I'll just press OK. And here we're saving our model and analyzing, and we can see here that it's generating a lot of load cases. Even though I only defined one, what's happening is that each 0.2 meter increment, we're having a new position for our wheel loads, and it's solving that as a separate load case.
Now we can start looking at the results here. I'll start by just looking at the graphical results window drop down list. We can see we have our parent moving load case, which contains kind of the envelope for all the other load cases that have been generated. But I also have each individual step. So I have step number one. And if I just display the location of our loads, maybe I'll look at a side view, we can see what that looks like. So this is step number one. Step number two, this wheel load pattern has moved a little bit. And I can just keep incrementing this. And eventually we'll see another load pop up. And this will continue as we move along. Now I can look at the deflection diagram and I can see what the deflection in the model looks like as these move along. I can also look at different shell contours to see what those look like. So if I look at maybe one that might be of interest here just to make it easier to see, Z displacement, we can see that as we move, the maximum displacement position is going to change as well and also the value. So every time we move the load location, our results will change. Now, an easier way to view this would be going to run and then S view. And if you haven't used S view before, it's a great tool for model validation and results viewing. It renders your model in richer detail and allows you to see this information a lot more clearly. So just opened up on my other screen here. But what I can do here is I can actually show you, well, I'll start with the element view. We have a lot of control over how this is scaled and rendered and so on, but I'm just going to start by clicking the play button after I selected my moving load case. And we can see here what that looks like as the wheel load pattern moves. Now this is obviously an exaggerated deflection view, but it gives us an idea for what's happening. Another option is we can show contour diagrams within S view. And for this case here, I'm just going to go with a stress contour. I'll say the SXY uh, axis stress contour here. I'm going to say generate. And if I just start from the beginning, we'll see what our contours look like as we move the wheel load patterns along. So you can see here from these contours, it's pretty easy to tell where the wheel loads are and the results change accordingly. Now, this view is available for anybody using S-Frame free of charge. You can even download it from our website if you're curious. But you should already have it if you've installed S-Frame under Run S-View.